we're just waiting for the participants to file in and we'll get started in just a minute. Great, I'm gonna get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Meredith Flute, the director of the Iris and B. Gerald Cantor Art Gallery. And I'm pleased that you all can join us here today. Um, in a minute, we'll start our talk by Dr. Rebecca Van Diver, who was originally, is of course originally scheduled to be in person um, and meant to kick off our opening for the exhibition, The Art of Elizabeth Catlett from the collection of Samela Lewis which is currently, currently on view at the Cantor Gallery. Um, even though we couldn't host a large event today, I want to emphasize that you all can come to see the Catlett Show in person. The Cantor Gallery is free and open to both the Holy Cross community and the public Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday from 12 to 5. We are working with the college administration to manage and update safety protocols during the COVID pandemic and we'll continue to update our website and social media sites with current information about visiting the gallery. And we'll remain open until 7 p.m. tonight if anyone's on campus and wants to stop by. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to say a few thank yous to those people who have been instrumental in bringing this exhibition to Holy Cross. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share the art of Elizabeth Catlett, sculptor, printmaker, as well as educator and activist with our Holy Cross and Worcester communities and believe that Catlett's work possesses a unique ability to generate dialogue around the essential relationship between artistic production and social and political activism. The exhib exhibition, which was originally organized by the August Wilson African American Cultural Center in Pittsburgh is doubly special due to the fact that all of the works in it come from the private collection of Samela Lewis, an artist, an art historian, student, and lifelong friend of Elizabeth Catlett. The relationship between artist and collector adds a meaningful dimension to this representative selection of Catlett's work. I wanna say thank you to a few specific people who worked to make this exhibition possible, including Paula Rosenblum, Assistant Director for Communications and Operations here at the Cantor, and Timothy Johnson, preparator, installer, and designer extraordinaire. Paula and Tim's work their professionalism and expertise are essential to the programming and mounting of all Cantor exhibitions, and this one especially. I also want to thank the college and Holy Cross leadership, especially our new president, Vincent Rougeau, uh, Provost Margaret Frigi, and Dean of Faculty Anne-Marie Leskovich. The Cantor benefits from the generous support of the college administration, and we're grateful for their leadership. A quick note on today's format. We have organized this as a webinar and Dr. Van Diver will talk for about 15, 45 minutes. Um, throughout, you should feel free to submit questions um, via the Q&A function. I will pay attention to those questions and we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end to answer them. And you can keep submitting questions. I'll keep paying attention through the whole talk. Okay, with that out of the way, I want to welcome our speaker, Professor Rebecca Van Diver. Dr. Van Diver is an assistant professor of art history at Vanderbilt University, where she teaches courses on modern and contemporary African and African-American art and visual culture, women artists 1850 to, present, to the present, art and controversy in, the 20th, in 20th century American art and other related topics. Her research focuses on 20th century black female artists, including her recent book, Designing a New Tradition, Lois Mylou Jones and the Aesthetics of Blackness, published in 2020. Dr. Van Diver has also published on black feminist curatorial practices of the, 19, of the 1970s and contributed to the catalog for the Alma Thomas retrospective, which is currently on view at the Chrysler Museum in Virginia and which will travel to the Phillips Collection and to the Frist Museum in Nashville, among other places. She is currently working on a digital humanities project that investigates the way the ways in which the US black popular press covered African-American artists and art events in the mid 20th century. And some Holy Cross students might be particularly interested in this DH project. Um, so I just wanted to mention it and give you permission to ask questions about it at the end of the Q and A. 
Dr. Van Diver's article, The Torture of Mothers, Elizabeth Catlett's Prince as Call for Reproductive Justice, published in the art journal this summer, connects to her current research direction on the ephemeral print in African-American art. It's also, in my opinion, the best recent work that I've seen on Catlett, and one of the reasons that I'm so pleased that she's here to speak with us today with the talk, My Art Speaks for Both My People, an introduction to Elizabeth Catlett's artistic activism. So welcome, Dr. Van Diver. Thank you so much for that generous uh, introduction. I'm so appreciative of it. And I'm just gonna get, I'm getting back into this Zoom, right? so let me get sorted. And I just wanted to say first that it is such a pleasure to be here with all of you virtually this afternoon, early evening, uh, to mark what was supposed to be a sort of in-person opening of the art of Elizabeth Catlett from the collection of Samela Lewis. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to extend my sincere thank you um, to curator Meredith Luke for this really kind invitation to share some thoughts on the remarkable career of Elizabeth Catlett and to Paula Rosenblum for coordinating logistics and helping us make this transition um, from what would have been in person at the library to this now virtual uh, event. And thank you to all of you. I know that this is an incredibly busy start of the semester. Uh, so thank you for being here. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, also by way of sort of a content warning that my talk today will uh, include some discussion of anti-Black violence uh, and lynching. Let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay, so I borrowed the title of my talk uh, today, My Art Speaks for Both My Peoples, an introduction to Elizabeth Catlett's artistic activism from a profile on Elizabeth Catlett that appeared in the January 1970 issue of Ebony Magazine. In many ways, the article served as a reintroduction of Catlett uh, to Ebony's African-American readers. Born in Washington, DC in 1915, Catlett moved to Mexico City in 1946 and became a Mexican citizen in 1962, which let, led the US government to brand her an undesirable alien. At the time of the Ebony coverage, uh, and shown here is the spread in the cover, Catlett had, was enjoying considerable professional success. In 1970, the Mexico City Museo de Art Moderno held a major exhibition of her work. Experience, Experiencia Negra, Escultura y Grabado de Elizabeth Catlett. In September of 1971, Elizabeth Catlett Prints and Sculpture opened at the Studio Museum in Harlem. The exhibition, Catlett's first U.S. museum show since 1948, marked a homecoming for Catlett as well, when the U.S. granted her a visa to attend the opening. Catlett saw her art as serving two people, or two audiences rather, one Mexican and one African-American. We'll see that she exemplified an artist for whom their politics and artistic practice are inextricably linked. In my time with you all today, I want to introduce you to Catlett's artistic activism to underscore her significance within the canon of African-American art will trace the evolution of Catlett's career, dating from her time as an undergraduate at Howard University in the 1930s, through her involvement with the social realist movement in the United States in the 1940s, her eventual move to Mexico, where she becomes active within the anti-fascist printmaking collective, the Talia Grafica Popular, uh, where she's active in the 1950s and into the 1960s and 1970s, when she begins to make persuasive works of art in service of the ongoing US-based civil rights and global black liberation movements. As both a sculptor and a printmaker, Catlett believed adamantly that art functioned as a key vehicle for social change and political awareness. Her prints in particular held political potential. She noted in a 1989 interview, quote, 
in the printmaking, I'm thinking about something social or political. And in the sculpture, I'm thinking about form, but I'm also thinking about women, black women, end quote. The lived experiences of black and brown women emerge as a major theme in her printed and sculptural work. While she was a prolific sculptor, making work in terracotta, wood and stone, I'll be focusing my remarks today on her printmaking, which comprises the bulk of the exhibit currently on view at the Cantor Gallery. Catlett grew up in Washington, DC. With her father dying shortly after her birth, Catlett's mother raised Elizabeth and her two siblings. The children spent summers in North Carolina with their maternal grandparents. And in a lot of Catlett's um, printed work, we'll see a strong uh, matrilineal impulse that I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A. In the 1930s, she attended Howard University, where she studied with important African-American artists, James A. Porter, Lois Melu Jones, and James Lacine Wells. Uh, shown here uh, in this photograph, uh, Lois Maylou Jones in the center and a young James Porter on the far left. Importantly, Catlett's undergraduate career at Howard dovetailed with the rise of the university's Department of Art. So in many ways, she was at the center of the African-American art world as an undergraduate. So just as all of you are sitting uh, on campus uh, in the midst of uh, sort of the intellectual environment. When Catlett arrives at Howard in the 1930s, the historically Black college and university is the epicenter of Black intellectualism. After her 1935 graduation, Catlett takes a position teaching, um, oh, before I get that, I almost skipped over the uh, other image here, which is a, a program that uh, Catlett designs for the Howard University Choir uh, in 1932. Uh, this particular work is gonna look a lot different from her later work. She's an undergraduate sort of experimenting with uh, or being introduced to new artistic uh, techniques. Uh, and I wanted to include it here because you'll note in the caption that this particular flyer comes from the collection of Lois Melu Jones. Uh, and so Lois Melu Jones kept this piece of student work. And as uh, Meredith mentioned at the start, uh, this sort of thinking about collections, about the teacher-student relationship. Uh, here, Jones functioning as one of Catlett's uh, instructors and later colleagues, uh, and the exhibit on view at the Cantor coming from the collection of Simella Lewis, uh, who is first Catlett student, uh, and then her, uh, her colleague. So after Catlett graduates from Howard in 1935, she takes a job teaching in the Durham, North Carolina public school system. Uh, and while there, she becomes active uh, in working to raise the salaries of uh, the African-American teachers who are being paid half of what their white counterparts uh, are being paid. Uh, she eventually leaves Durham and enrolls at the University of Iowa, where in 1940, she receives one of the university's first MFA degrees. During her two years at Iowa, she takes sculpture classes with Harry Stinson, painting with the renowned American regionalist Grant Wood, shown here with his iconic uh, American Gothic. And she takes art history courses with H.W. Jansen, who will become the author of the later survey textbook, The History of Art. While we know Catlett today uh, as a printmaker, uh, as well as a sculptor, it's interesting to note that Catlett was almost denied an MFA degree due to her lack of printmaking classes. The absence of graduate training in the medium caused Lester Longman, the director of Iowa's Department of Art, to suggest that Catlett apply for a Master's of Arts degree rather than an MFA degree. Uh, and there's speculation that this was in part because the university was reluctant uh, to award its first uh, MFA degree to a Black woman. Catlett successfully lobbied to have her undergraduate courses in printmaking taken at Howard with James Lacine Wells to count towards uh, this graduate requirement. For her master's thesis at the University of Iowa, Catlett presented photographs, preparatory drawings, models, and the now lost limestone sculpture entitled Negro Mother and Child, shown here on the left. 
The small scale sculpture, which measured 36 inches high, depicted a young mother cradling an infant in her lap. In the accompanying text, Catlett explained, quote, the implications of motherhood, especially Negro motherhood, are quite important to me, as I am a Negro, as well as a woman, end quote. Her choice of subject and accompanying description reflected Grant Wood's encouragement of students to focus their art on things that you know most about. Catlett would remark, I knew the most about Black people. Even before she became a mother herself, Catlett saw the mother and child motif as one, quote, in which Blackness and femaleness intersect, end quote. The theme of Black and Brown motherhood pervades Catlett's artistic practice. As scholar Melanie Herzog aptly notes, Catlett's maternity-themed art, both printed and sculpted, serves as, quote, acts of resistance against the images of maternity abounding in art, which had nothing to do with these women's lives, end quote. Catlett exhibited mother and child in the summer of 1940 at the Art of the American Negro exhibition hosted as part of the larger American Negro exhibition, exposition rather in Chicago. As the first Black organized World's Fair, the exposition sought to bring national attention to African-American artists. Catlett's entry received first prize in sculpture. Three years later, Catlett's former Howard University professor, James Porter, lauded the work in his 1943 survey, Modern Negro Art, declaring, quote, the work exemplifies good taste and soberly thoughtful execution, end quote. Such accolades cemented Catlett's position as a promising young black sculptor. Her renown and development as a printmaker came later. After graduating from Iowa, Catlett took a teaching position at the historically Black Dillard University in New Orleans. But she only stayed two years due to ongoing conflict with university administration in chafing at the Southern segregation. For instance, she had to take, receive special permission to take her students to the Delgado Museum of Art in New Orleans because it was located in a segregated park. It was at Dillard that she taught Samela Lewis, shown here on the right, a New Orleans native who would go on to become a major artist and art historian in her own right. Catlett spent summers in Chicago and became involved in the Southside Community Art Center where she honed her lithography skills, her leftist politics, and met her first husband, Charles White. Creating alongside artists such as Eldazir Kortor, Char Archibald Motley, and Margaret Burroughs, Catlett's leftist political ideology took off. She found aesthetic solidarity in the work of Burroughs and White, who like her were committed social realists interested in portraying the black proletariat. And here on screen is a photograph of Charles White teaching uh, a drawing class uh, in a quote uh, that really exemplifies uh, the way, the sort of ethos um, behind uh, the art that White and uh, Catlett begin to make in the 1940s. Uh, and I'll quote uh, White here, art must be an integral part of the struggle. It can't simply mirror what's taking place. It must adapt itself to human needs. It must ally itself with the forces of liberation. The fact is artists have always been propagandists. I have no use for artists who try to divorce themselves from the struggle. In 1942, Catlett and then husband Charles White moved to New York City where Catlett merges her interest in art and politics. She takes classes at the Art Student League while fundraising for the George Washington Carver School. She teaches ceramics at the downtown Marxist Jefferson School of Social Science and volunteers uh, for the w Russian War Relief Fund. Her work with these leftist community oriented schools brought the working class as a subject to the forefront of her artistic endeavors which would soon see her, see her leave the United States for Mexico, 
So in the center here is her 1943 war worker uh, in which she is painting a portrait of uh, one of her night school students who would have been working in a factory with a national defense contract during the day uh, and then attending classes at the uh, George Washington Carver School in the evenings. Uh, and we'll see that Catlett remains committed uh, to representational imagery and giving um, voice and face to um, figures who she saw as sort of being marginalized or overlooked. In New York, Catlett was studying printmaking at the Artist Student League in Midtown, uh, and she's also refining her sculptural practice uh, by taking classes with the Russian-born French sculptor um, Asip Zadkine. And Zadkine encouraged Catlett to explore the aesthetic possibilities of African art. So Catlett would have been familiar with African art from her time at Howard, where both um, Porter and Jones were incorporating African art into their classes there. But it's with Zadkine that Catlett really begins to explore uh, the sort of aesthetic possibilities uh, and exploring abstraction in particular. And Zadkine taught her that abstraction didn't need to take away uh, from her desire to produce representational imagery, uh, but more so that it could teach her to eliminate the, uh, oops, sorry here, that it could teach her to eliminate uh, non-essential detail and to concentrate on form, on angles and curves, concavity and convexity, so solids and spaces in a process that would lead to the quote, purification of representation. And so we see some of that at play in one of Catlett's earliest recorded prints shown here on the right, a lithograph entitled Mother and Child uh, from 1944, in which Catlett combines her interest in the mother-child motif with her explorations of form. So in this print, we see Catlett offering a, a vision of maternal love, Black maternal love, by recasting the white uh, Madonna and child iconography. The schematic stylized faces of the figures, and we also see this at play in her war worker from 1943, uh, indicative of her explorations of abstraction and perhaps the influence of African masks uh, in sculptures. And I have on the far left uh, an example of uh, Zadkine's work as well. Uh, so we can see how uh, he's sort of encouraging her to explore some of the formal possibilities uh, of both her sculpture and uh, in her prints. In Mother and Child, a tightly cropped composition, a Black mother swathed in cloth uh, curls her infant uh, to her chest. Her hand grips the baby's shoulder and her forearm shields the child from the world outside the picture plane. Behind them, uh, a path extends into uh, the horizon beside a barren tree. A symbol of maternal devotion, love and sacrifice, the Madonna represents the qualities that white hegemony deemed mothers as black mothers as lacking. As such, white artists rarely picture Black women as Madonnas. In her discussion of the visibility of Black motherhood, Daniel Fuentes Morgan remarks, quote, where the Madonna is prized and elevated, the Black mother is disparaged and object. Presenting the Black mother as Madonna, Catlett resists this determination and she'll return frequently uh, to this Black mother as Madonna um, in her printed work through the 1980s. Um, on screen here is her Black Madonna from 1982. The increasingly anti-left policies in the United States led Catlett and White to seek opportunities elsewhere. Prior to the onset of World War II, White was awarded a Julius Rosenwald Fund Fellowship, awarded by a Jewish-run philanthropic organization that offered fellowships to African Americans in a range of fields, including the creative arts. White had wanted to travel to Mexico to study with the famed Mexican muralists. However, with the onset of World War II, the draft board denied White's appeal and he was unable to take the fellowship. 
1945, Catlett applies for and receives her own Rosenwald. She was awarded $1,800 to do a, quote, series of lithographs, paintings, and sculptures of Negro women in the fight for democratic rights in the United States. Catlett originally thought she would complete the project in New York but found herself overcommitted. And in 1946, the couple decamps to Mexico. Catlett's move to Mexico is pivotal for her art and for her life. Over the course of the next 30 years, Catlett develops an activist artistic practice that is explicitly transnational, aimed at reaching audiences, particularly women, across the US-Mexico divide. So when Catlin and White arrive in Mexico City in 1946, they join an international cohort of Cold War exiles. The couple also reconnect with some of the Mexican muralists that they became acquainted with in New York City. Catlett and her US contemporaries found inspiration in the Mexican muralists such as Diego Rivera, whose social realist public murals incited political action. Once settled in Mexico, Catlett and White began working as guest artists in the Talier Grafica Popular, known as the TGP. Founded in 1937 as an anti-fascist organization, the TGP operated as a printmaking collective whose artists embraced the power of print to spread political messages, advance social causes, and at times critique state power. It should be noted that as an American citizen living in Mexico, Catlett was barred from participating outright in local politics. Her initial informal affiliation with the TGP gave her a visual voice in a community of politically like-minded artistic comrades. Some of the TGP members were active within the Communist Party, including Catlett's husband, Charles White. The TGP met weekly and encouraged collaboration and dialogue. Catlett explained, quote, people would come to the workshop if they had problems. We would ha then have a collective discussion about what symbolism would be effective in expressing those concerns. So I love this graphic here um, from a museum exhibition of the TGP's work, uh, because on the left, we see uh, sort of that studio environment with multiple artists working side by side. Uh, and then on the right hand of the image, uh, the way in which the TGP disseminated uh, its information and its artwork, posting it in poster form on uh, public buildings and publicly accessible uh, places. So the TGP cemented Catlett's desire to quote unquote, put art in service of people. And her 20 years with the TGP, roughly 1946 to 1966, crystallized her printmaking practices, um, political bent and directly influenced her realist aesthetic and her mode of production, specifically her use of linoleum and woodcut. The TGP, and I have a selection of some of their uh, prints on screen here, uh, appropriated familiar imagery, including contemporary photographs, to make their prints messages legible uh, to the illiterate in Mexico. The group printed lino cuts and woodcuts in large editions with legible images on low cost newsprint and posted. Uh, their work in public spaces to ensure the widest reach possible. Their output was huge. The collective printed thousands of posters. And Catlin would come to understand the power of print for disseminating messages through affordable and accessible means. So when Catlett and White joined the TGP first as informal visitors in 1946, the group was at work on a major opus, the 85 print portfolio, Estampas de la Revolución Mexicana, which narrated scenes from Mexico's history beginning in the 1870s through the 1940s. While the primary focus was on the Mexican Revolution of 1910, the series also highlighted ongoing social injustices. Catlett too was on at work on a historical series that highlighted social and political injustice. 
Her 15 lino cut series, The Negro Woman, later retitled I Am the Black Woman, emphasized Black women's lives, highlighting heroic achievements and everyday activities as well as personal fears. The series realized Catlett's Julius Rosenwald Fund um, Fellowship Project on, quote, Negro women in the fight for democratic rights. In the opening image shown here on the left, uh, which comprises a hand-colored lino cut entitled I Am the Negro Woman, Catlett focuses on the face of a Black woman who emerges against a Black background. She's shown in three-quarters view. Her forehead, chin, and cheeks bound the edges of the square composition. And I want you to think about how the title, um, I am the Negro woman. And if you were standing there looking at the print and saying that out loud, how you're sort of invited in um, to sort of take her place, right? And how uh, the title sort of is inviting the viewer um, to speak and hear this, view this history uh, through this particular lens. And when you have the opportunity to visit uh, the exhibition um, as it's installed, I want you to take note of the various strategies that Catlett is using to draw you into the artwork, right? Is it her titles, her use of perspective, uh, the repetition that we'll see both in terms of theme, but also within the prints. And I'm happy to talk more about that uh, in the Q&A. The Catlett's depictions of Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and Phyllis Wheatley that also appear as various cuts uh, within uh, the series charted the mat matriarchal lineage of Black liberation. So from the outset of Catlett's printmaking career, she's engaging in radical feminist acts, here figuring historical Black women who are often elided from history. As time progresses, Catlett becomes embedded within the TGP and the larger Mexican scene, and she becomes equally involved for the fight for women's liberation occurring in Mexico. In the second to last cut, uh, number 14 shown here on the far left, entitled A Special Fear for My Loved Ones, Catlett comments on the ongoing anti-Black lynching practices. A young man lays on a sharp diagonal with a noose cinched around his neck. The feet of the three perpetrators who stand um, around the victim stepping on the rope appear on the vertical composition's top edge. Although powerful as a standalone image, seen within the context of the Negro Woman series, Catlett drew a connection between anti-Black violence, fear, and Black women. I argue elsewhere that with this move, Catlett anticipates later calls for reproductive justice. Catlett returned to the United States in 1947, where she divorced White and married Mexican artist Francisco Mora, with whom she had collaborated with at the TGP. While in Washington, D.C., Catlett gave birth to the couple's first child, a son named Francisco. Shortly after Francisco's birth, the newly expanded family returned to Mexico permanently. Upon their return, Mora and Catlett formally joined the TGP. The couple welcomed a second son, Juan, in 1949, and a third son, David, joined the brood in 1951. While the demands of child rearing lead Catlett to take a 10-year hiatus from sculpture, she continued printmaking. And she found creativity in motherhood, telling Ebony in that 1970 profile with which I began that raising children was, quote, the most creative thing I could think of, end quote. During the 1940s and 1950s, uh, when Catlett is uh, an official full member of the TGP, the collective is at its prime. And Catlett collaborates on a number of projects, including the two sheet poster for the first National Mexican Peace Congress shown here. Uh, working with Alberto Beltran, again, the TGP saw themselves as collaborative. So oftentimes you'll see um, Catlett working with one or two other artists in service of um, producing a, a final image. That Catlett designed this large scale print, which features a massive hand split between two horizontal sheets of paper. 
Beneath the hands bent wrist, six figures stare out um, at the left, where a bevy of bayonets attached to rifles of soldiers unseen stab forward in search of victims. The large hand representative of the Mexican resistance to war catches the points in their palm. In the center stands a peasant woman who pulls her infant child to the small of her neck. As in her 1944 mother and child, Catlett accentuates the mother's protective grip by highlighting her forearm, here using lines to delineate the muscular grasp. The print foreshadowed the forced disappearances of the next decade when the PRI government in Mexico took action against its opponents. Integrating herself into Mexican society and raising a trio of Afro-Mexican sons, Catlett began to pay artistic attention to the working class Mexican women who surrounded her. She grew increasingly aware of mestizaje, the blending of indigenous, Spanish, and, Mex and African ancestries shared by many in Mexico. In La Presa, shown here uh, on the left, uh, the dam, uh, is exemplary of some of the prints, uh, types of prints that Catlett made during her time with the TGP and the group's celebration of Mexicanidad or the Mexican revolutionary spirit. This particular print on the left comes from a series created uh, to celebrate Lazaro um, Cardenas's pre presidency. Uh, the dam here showcasing the way in which the president had channeled environmental resources into impoverished areas of the country, improving education and adding electricity. Other prints highlighted literacy campaigns uh, among the young and the old, such as these two examples I have here on the right. In another poster made with TGB colleagues around 1950, Catlett captured the emotional and physical suffering of striking minors and their families at the hands of corporate interests. So, they make this poster um, after there's a big mining strike uh, in uh, Rosi Rosita in Colete, uh, a different region outside of Mexico City. Uh, and the text along the top and the bottom of this poster reads, the death rate of children from hunger and sickness in Rosita and Colete is great. We must help those who remain. A large image of a grieving mother cradling her dead child dominates this composition. The visibility of the ch child's protruding ribs suggests starvation as the cause of death. And so Catlett used the child's placement and the dangling arm and the hanging head to present the mourning miner's wife as a latter-day Mexican pieta. Here, I'm thinking of Michelangelo's um, pieta that is at St. Peter's. Perhaps cognizant of the fleet of childhood's fleeting nature and that she would soon be entering a new phase uh, when her youngest son, David, started school. In 1955, Catlett carved the block for mis hijos, my sons. The lino cut car captures her three boys playing with the Day of the Dead mask on a city sidewalk. An empty brick wall forms the background. Notably, it was in 1955 that the Mexican government forbade the gluing of posters to buildings in downtown Mexico City, an edict that would change how the TGP could circulate its messages. With only two of three faces visible, the print is not a portrait of Catlett's three sons, but rather maybe a snapshot. And I wanna be careful here not to romanticize Catlett's relationship to motherhood or to her children. Um, while much of Catlett's work emanates from her own positionality as a Black woman, Mis Hijos is a rare example of her personal life showcased in her artwork. Uh, her titular choices in other prints um, speak to the general rather than the, the specific. Uh, and an example of that would be her uh, 1959 Black maternity shown here. Uh, and this lithograph evinces, of course, her ongoing exploration of Black motherhood, but also her stylistic evolution. The lithograph, which also appeared on the cover of the 1978 US-based journal, The Black Scholar, um, in which we see a young mother cradling a young child in her arms. 
In comparison to her earlier planographic print, the 1944 Mother and Child, the figures in Black maternity are strikingly more naturalistic. The young child and mother stand arms entwined. Uh, and as we saw in her earlier mother and child in black maternity, the mother's shoulder and forearm continue to dominate the foreground, but her grasp has loosened as she sort of scoops her child in her arms. The pair fills the entire compositional frame. Gone is the winding path and ominous background. Rather, the duo is happy and content. Melanie Herzog notes that although Black maternity is infused with naturalism, the backlighting of the image imparts a halo-like effect. Catlett presents Black motherhood as something sacred and joyful. At this particular time, Catlett was enjoying her own family and increased professional success. In 1958, she joined the faculty at the prestigious National Autonomous University of Mexico, also known as UNAM. Founded in 1551, UNAM is the largest university in Latin America. Catlett was the first woman to teach in the university's School of Fine Arts, uh, and she came under fire when the director named her the chair of the sculpture department. And note here that we see her returning to sculpture as a medium in the late 1950s. She'd stopped working in sculpture, sculpture while uh, she was raising her children. In part, she didn't have uh, studio space available to her uh, in order to make the sculptural work that she was interested in doing. So with her new position at UNAM comes uh, a studio suitable uh, for making this type of work. Uh, her position at UNAM would also bring her to the front lines of some of the Mexican student demonstrations that occur in the late 1960s. She remains at UNAM uh, until her 1976 retirement. So Catlett's decision to officially affiliate with the TGP uh, was a choice that became risky. Uh, because the FBI had labeled the TGP a communist front organization, this led U.S. diplomats in Mexico to harass Catlett. And in 1959, things reached ahead and she's arrested uh, and held as a foreign agitator. The ordeal, her arrest and subsequent separation from her family, uh, led Catlett to apply for Mexican citizenship. And the Mexican government grants her citizenship request in 1962. Catlett's disavowal of US citizenship enabled her to speak freely about Mexican politics without fear of deportation, but it also severed ties with the United States who declared her an undesirable alien. So Catlett finds herself with a growing family living in exile, but this doesn't stop her from using her art as a vehicle to spread politically conscious messages. Now officially an artist in exile, Catlett's transnational activism burgeons in new ways. She promotes public art accessible and legible to audiences of color worldwide. She participated in several international conferences and forges allegiances with new political causes. In 1961, she makes uh, what will end up being her last trip to the US uh, for over a, de for a decade uh, when she travels uh, to deliver the keynote for the National Conference of Negro Artists that was held in Washington, DC. Uh, demanding that uh, African-American artists join the fight for liberation, Catlett insisted, quote, neither the Negro artist nor American art can afford to take an isolated position. Further, she said, are we here to communicate? Are we here for intercultural exchange? Then let us not be narrow. Let us not be small or selfish. Let us aspire to be as great in our communication as the forefathers of our people whose struggles made our being here possible. Accomplishing the goal of enacting political change 
through visual means would require a reconsideration of artistic production, both in content and in form. For Catlett, the print, its ease of reproduction and transportation made it her preferred medium for social justice in that the messages could circulate widely and at a relatively low expense. In 1963, Catlett visited Cuba to attend the Congress of Women in the Americas with the Mexican delegation. Participants there heard reports on the state of American women and numerous social causes. In his closing speech, Fidel Castro called for a revolution, saying, quote, when discussions are held about the rights of women, of their aspirations, we can see that there cannot be rights of women in our America or rights of children, mothers, or wives if there is no revolution. The woman must necessarily be revolutionary. And Catlett here in this print uh, entitled American Women Unite completed the same year that she travels uh, to Cuba to partake in this uh, global uh, symposium. Uh, in here we see her using sort of this trio motif of overlapping faces, uh, combining uh, sort of the formal composition of the figures to speak to this larger goal of unification. And uh, we'll see her employ this trio motif um, in a number of her prints uh, as well. So this Congress uh, of Women in the Americas uh, really lit a fire amongst the Mexican delegates. Uh, and they came back to Mexico City, um, really charged up and decided to form uh, their own national um, organization of Mexican um, women. Uh, and Catlett serves on the executive board of this organization um, known as the UNMM until 1975. Uh, and her role um, allowed her to help shape the organizational feminist, uh, the organization's feminist agenda and brought her into the orbit even more so of the working and peasant class women who were also members. Uh, her involvement with the UNMM in the mid 60s coincides with her um, disaffiliation with the TGP. So she formally disaffiliates with the TGP in 1966. And so while she's on the one hand becoming more involved in Mexican politics, she also finds herself um, called to participate uh, more so uh, with the Black nationalists in emerging feminist movements in the United States. Uh, and we'll see how she begins to put her art uh, in service of uh, the revolutions that these uh, movements are promoting. So she's living in Mexico, but still feeling a really strong uh, connection to the growing Black arts and Black national movements in the United States. And so the US-based Black arts movement uh, of the late 1960s was promoting politically engaged art and diasporic racial solidarity. So unable to travel to the United States after declaring Mexican citizenship, Catlett would send her art across the border through the postal service or with friends, back with friends who would come uh, and visit her. And Catlett's prints, particularly those that were produced in editions of multiple copies, become an essential vehicle for her transnational engagement. So prints like Malcolm X Speaks for Us, shown here on the left, and Negro Esbello II on the right, through formal and ideological means imbricated Catlett uh, to the Black aesthetic. And I wanna draw your attention here to Catlett's citing of her own work uh, in the Malcolm X Speaks for Us on the left. You see how on the top register of that print, she's reproduced the first image from her earlier um, 1947, I Am the Negro Woman series. Uh, and also we see repetition at play uh, in her Negro Esbello too, where we have uh, the Black Panther um, emblem, um, pin sort of repeated on a grid, uh, but also her desire to sort of expand the geographic boundaries of that message, titling uh, her print in Spanish, sort of translating that Black is beautiful to a Mexican, that would be legible to a Mexican audience. 
Uh, and in both of these, we see the primacy of the Black woman, again, emerge, emerges as a central concern of hers. So taken together, uh, the artworks that she's producing uh, in the late 1960s comprise what art historian Kelly Jones has named uh, Catlett's Black Activist Oeuvre. So two October 1968 events in Mexico City are going to further galvanize Catlett's transnational political consciousness and her growing concern for the safety of young people of color. So the first is um, the Teletico Massacre, an infamous uh, episode in the Mexican Dirty War, in which we see the Mexican military firing upon student protesters, uh, killing at least dozens. And I should note that Catlett's own sons were participating in the student demonstrations of 1968. And then the second is the Black Power Salute moment of the 1968 Olympics, which were held in Mexico City uh, a few weeks later. So perhaps inspired uh, by this later public display, uh, Catlett's cedar sculpture shown here on the far left, homage to my young Black sisters, placed a Black woman both on the podium, um, and I'm thinking here of the plinth on which the sculpture stands, and metaphorically at the center of the Black Power movement. If we think of the Olympians raised um, fist as emblematic of uh, this Black Power ethos. In her celebration of quote unquote young Black sisters, Catlett again charts a genealogy of Black political kinship through the achievements of Black women. Uh, and on screen here, I have her later um, political prisoner from 1971, uh, again, in which we see um, a Black woman um, as the protagonist uh, here with the red, black, and green reference to the Black nationalist um, uh, colors. Uh, and here, Catlett's making a statement about the role of Black women within the Black uh, nationalist movement. So while embracing the tenets of Black nationalism and the Black arts movement, um, Catlett stayed true to her commitment to visualize Black women's lived experiences. And to do so, she deployed artistic methods that she had acquired during her time with the TGP. And here I'm talking about simple, effective visual language that's at times based on extant photographs. In 1970, Catlett made two prints uh, that mediated the late 1960s racial turbulence in the US through Black maternity. The torture of mothers shown here on the right and her lino cut Watts, Detroit, Washington, Harlem, and Newark. In her powerful The Torture of Mothers, a Black woman's head floats on a white background with an adolescent Black boy's body stretched from her crown to her chin. He lies in a jagged edged pool of red Rivulets of blood flow from his head, chest, and hands. His super, the way his body is superimposed onto the woman's head suggests a biological and psychological relationship between the woman and the child. The young man's placement also indicates that his fate weighs on her mind. Picturing the, a bloodied Black boy within the contours of his mother's body, Catlett here levied the critique of anti-Black violence and state power through the maternal, connecting the conditions of Black life with those of Black maternity. With the unrest in U the U.S. and in Mexico, Catlett didn't need to create a fictional scene. To compose the print, she drew from published accounts documenting the 1960s wave of US anti-Black violence. She borrowed the print's title from this book um, by Truman Nelson, published in 1968. And the other image, the photo of the young victim of police brutality comes from the cover of Life magazine on which uh, a photo of Joe Bass Jr. splayed on bloody asphalt appeared in July 28. While Bass Jr. ultimately survives his injuries, the photograph's power lay in how it portrayed uh, Bass as being sort of suspended between youth and adulthood, between 
being an innocent bystander and a, the perceived perpetrator. So the torture of mothers is consistently read as a response to a specific, if prolonged, state of racial emergency. The rebellion of rebellions of the US based 1960s black freedom struggle and the ensuing violence and offers in the words of Kelly Jones, quote, a petition of black death. In what I conceive of as its pendant print, Watts, Detroit, Washington, Harlem, and Newark, Catlett features a pair of armed uh, white National Guard officers wielding rifles amid the bodies of four black men enclosed in red and black pods that suggest amniotic sac. Catlett's title cites the most deadly of the 1960s race rebellions, uh, Los Angeles 1965, Detroit 1967, Washington DC 1968, Harlem 1964, and Newark 1967. By juxtaposing these sites of disparate rebellions using the forward slash, and I'm gonna come back to that forward slash uh, as I conclude in a moment, she emphasized how they formed part of an ongoing narrative of anti-Black violence. In July 1970, the Museo de Art Moderno exhibited both of these prints in Catlett's show entitled The Black Experience. Although the prints drew from photographs published in the US media, the underlying messages of maternal fear and police brutality resonated with the Mexican audience still reeling from the 1968 unrest and the ongoing dirty war. Catlett expressed her desire to show a few prints in Harlem where some of her, our people could see them, she said. And in September, 1971, Elizabeth Catlett Prints and Sculpture opened at the Studio Museum in Harlem. For Catlett, the means of production was paramount. She championed the production of publicly accessible, legible art. Throughout her career, she deployed her printmaking practice as a strategy of resistance to counter racial and social injustices in Mexico and in the US. And on screen here, um, we see uh, her contributions to the Free Angela Davis campaign in the 1970s. So working in Mexico, she's contacted by uh, the Free Angela Davis campaign and helps uh, design uh, the poster shown here on the far left. And then after Davis's release, um, completes this serial portrait in 1972. So Catlett retires from her teaching position in uh, at the UNAM in 1975 and moves away from Mexico City with her husband, yet she continues to make art. Uh, in 1975, she pens an essay titled The Role of the Black Artist, in which she poses a series of questions to her fellow artists. Uh, how do we develop to serve the Black community? What is our role? What form do we use? What content? What are our priorities? She continues to champion public art as vehicles to engage community. And as she queried the forms and content of Black art, her own 1970 era prints, which explored themes of Black motherhood and the contours of Black womanhood, suggested some answers. In her later work, Catlett appears to call upon the next generation to take up the cause. Her 1992 second generation speaks to the legacy of activism and the ongoing struggle. And I wanna conclude with her um, the returning to her torture of mothers, which she had reprinted in 2003. And when she reprints it in 2003, she changes only the date line, which now reads 1972 slash 2003. I can't tell if you can make it out here um, at the bottom, um, but this paint, this print is on view uh, at the canter. And in fact, I didn't know that Catlett had reprinted this um, particular work until I saw it in another iteration of this same uh, exhibition. Uh, and so the slash mark, which as I said, also appears in the title for her Watts, Detroit, Washington, Harlem, and Newark indicates the different printing dates, but also suggests the potential continuity of the print's theme over time. And so Catlett's message of maternal mourning and anti-Black violence within the torture of mothers endures, if not from Catlett's matrix. 
It resonates with resonated with audiences in 1970 and in 2003, and it continues to do so in 2021, as many Americans in various cities continue to protest the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, two of the most recent Black victims of state-sanctioned police brutality. And I think it's clear that Catlett's belief in the power of artistic activism also stays strong. And I encourage you as you go through the exhibition uh, at the Cantor to think about the various ways in which she is calling upon uh, her viewer uh, to incite action and melding her art with her politics. I, I wanna thank you all for spending um, part of your afternoon um, with me this today. Uh, and I wanna invite you to follow along. I, I have my Instagram handle here uh, as well as um, my website and I will um, stop here and I look forward to answering questions uh, that may have bubbled up. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. This has been really a great talk and um, so grateful that you came to do this because or came to do this because it, it provides so much rich context for um, understanding Catlett's work um, for anyone who would come to the exhibition. And it gives you such a broad sense of, of you know, gives you a lot of sense of what she was doing over a long period of time. Um, so, you know, I, I encourage you, you know, A, to come see the show after, you know, hearing this talk, B, um, to read Elizabeth Catlett's um, statement. I think it's, it's really, uh, again, one of those very helpful documents to understanding like what she was thinking about. Um, and also to read um, Rebecca's article on the torture of mothers, which um, sort of pulls out that particular print, but then gives a lot of, uh, you know, some, some of the same background that you're talking about, but then um, even more to, um, to that work. So there are some questions that are building up and I'm trying to decide. I think I'll start with somebody else's question, but I have a few of my own. Um, but the first question that, um, that I think I'll pose to you is um, one that was posed by uh, an attendee which is how would you describe the lasting effect of Catlett's time in New York on her work? Um, and what did she take from New York to Mexico and beyond? And Rebecca, you're gonna have to unmute. <laughs> I muted myself. First time, um, first time on Zoom, I know. Getting back onto, into this Zoom life. So I think that her time, well, I should say this. So their time in New York was not extensive. They moved there in 1942, but White at that time is also takes a job at Hampton University uh, in Virginia. So he's based in Virginia and they're sort of back and forth. I think her time in New York really crystallize some of her political views. As I mentioned, uh, she's volunteering for the Russian um, War Relief Fund. She's teaching at um, you know, the George Washington Carver School uh, as and sort of at the same time, sort of refining some of her own ideas about art making. Uh, so I think what she learns in New York is that she is dis increasingly dissatisfied with US politics, but she's also had uh, exposure to a larger, a large number of artistic practices um, with her studies at the art school, art student league uh, in Midtown where she actually meets one of the Mexican muralists, Raul Aguiano is also um, studying there while she's there. So they reconnect. Uh, in Mexico. I think she brings with her to Mexico already a really strong commitment to social realism. Uh, and so when she gets to the to Mexico City and into the TGP, that those uh, aesthetic and political ideas really meld well with what the collective is already doing. Great. And I, and I also love the idea that she was um, overcommitted. That was... <laughs> I felt like yes, yeah. <laughs> Pulled in so many different directions. Right. Yeah. Um, there's so many great questions. So uh, the next one I'm going to ask is from Melissa Trafton. Um, Professor Trafton, I find very convincing your argument and in your article um, that Catlett draws on popular imagery. Um, did her sources and style change depending upon the intended audience, American or Mexican? Um, and how or where were prints circulated, sold? Um, other than the Mexican posters and the Harlem show, um, how did she get them into the hands of intended audiences? Okay, great. So I'll say that, so she, 
uh, when, so one of the challenges is because she's affiliated with the TGP for so long, for the, those 20 years, that those artworks are oftentimes very collaborative in nature. And so some of them, you know, we can identify which was the artist who made them. Um, so for those works uh, that she's producing in service of the TGP, um, clearly those are aimed at um, a Mexican audience, although they are producing um, international works that are being distributed um, for um, anti-war and anti-fascist causes. Um, I think that what she's really trying to draw upon is a, or develop is a visual language that's able to transcend the borders or traverse the border and be legible to um, to both African Americans and to Mexicans. Um, and I think that becomes particularly clear when she starts exploring black motherhood in her prints and how um, those images might be read more universally. Um, I'm just gonna think, so how were the prints circulated and sold? So she did a few things. She would, she had a lot of visitors who would come um, to visit her in Mexico uh, and in Mexico City, and she would load them up <laughs> with things and send them back. They're in her papers, which are at the Amistad in uh, New Orleans, part of Tulane. There are um, some pretty frustrated uh, ex letter exchanges that she has with different um, dealers and gallerists. Um, she's represented, I think it's the Brockman Gallery in LA. Uh, and she, when she was trying to mail some of her sculptures, they would get broken because they'd be wooden. And so the gallerists would write back and be like, oh, we received you know, two of these, one of them's missing a foot. Uh, and she'd have to explain how to fix it uh, or have to send something else. So she's really relying on the postal service and on friends who are coming to bring things um, back and forth. I think the question of how she's selling is really important. And I would love to see more scholarship on the black art market and how the economics of that as I, allude to in my article, um, I was able to find some uh, information about the pricing of her work and she did want it to be priced accessibly so that people could buy it. So even though she's making quote unquote fine art prints, she didn't want them to be out of reach um, for the everyday uh, individual. Uh, and that's also in line with um, what Afrocobra is doing in the 70s as well in their production of screen prints and posters. So she's really, uh, I think, on, on the money to use a pun, if I can, in terms of how she's deciding to disseminate that. Um, I think I touched on every part of that question, I think. Um, Rebecca, I had a... Um... A sort of related question, um, and I think I see some reflection in some of my colleagues as well. So um, Susan Schmidt, who is professor of printmaking here at Holy Cross, asked um, uh, about serigraphy and about screen printing, which is something that we do have a number of objects in the show um, from sort of, they, they feel like that was a, 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 a medium that she started using later on yeah. but that question is was you know was this in, inspired by screen, screen print posters of the civil rights era um or was there another reason she started screen printing and i'm going to just pile on a second question okay. which is um you know is there a response you know in her sort of post 1971 moment when she you know she has that ebony you know interview and she has the studio museum in harlem show um is there a sense of of canonicity that changes about <laughs> does she does she I, i'm just interested in sort of how she might see herself as a leader mm -hmm. uh, and and her relationship you know beyond the market to maybe even museums um and collecting in that way yeah so i'll say so i think so the question so first i'll talk about the technique and her move to syria i mean i and that i also see um christina wilson's question about color which also emerges more explicitly in this later work when she moves to screen printing i don't know why she starts to do that um i think that her commitment well i have a, i guess i have a few thought guesses about it but i think that her earlier commitment to the woodcut into the lino cut is directly connected to what she has access to at the TGP. So that's those are what they're using. Those are the materials that they are acquiring. Um, and so that's what she has available to her. When she takes the position at UNAM, 
obviously that comes with studio space for sculptures, but it also, I would imagine, comes with more equipment, right? When she move, retires from UNAM and moves outside of Mexico City and sort of reestablishes a um, studio there, um, I'd be curious to know if that's where she's doing some of that screen printing. I know she also has um, Lou Stovall, uh, the Stovall workshop in Washington, DC is doing some of her printing uh, later on in the 80s and 90s. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers that question about how she started screen printing, but that is when we see the introduction of color. And there's a graduate student at Columbia who is thinking through Catlett's use of color and how um, she's sort of repeating that and what does it mean when she, when she adds those in and that we don't see them later. Although she is hand coloring some of her lino cuts um, prior to the move um, to, to screen prints. And then your second question, if I'm remembering correctly, Meredith, was around how Catlett saw herself um, to the canon and to the field. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay. I, yeah, so I, I think that, that big moment at the yeah. seven. Yeah, happened. well, I think it's also, you know, um, something I didn't talk about in the talk um, is that she's maintaining, you know, starting in 1950. So she graduates from um, Howard, 1935. Then she gets her MFA, then she takes a teaching position. Uh, and so she sees herself also as a teacher. And so I think that she's, and obviously she develops this longstanding relationship with um, Samela Lewis and her papers reveal that throughout, you know, her time in Mexico, people are writing to her, asking for her for advice. So I think she always saw herself as connected to the field, even though she wasn't able um, to travel to the United States. And I think that when we reach that moment in the 1970s, you know, she's getting close to retirement from her teaching position. It also corresponds to when we see her publish that article and she writes a number of articles around um, what it means to make black art. Uh, in the early 1970s. So I think that that show for her in 1971 at the Studio Museum is her sort of official homecoming, um, but she is sort of considered at that point um, a little bit of an elder states woman um, and is seen, I think, more along the lines of someone like Lois Maylou Jones, who's of this sort of um, approaching uh, the older generation. I think you can see this, but there are a number of questions about artistic influences. Um, and, uh, you know, Virginia Regan asked if, uh, if Catlett was aware of Kathy Kovitz. Yeah, she was um, aware of Kathy Kovitz. She'd seen her work in New York um, and refer makes explicit reference to, to her work, um, particularly um, the war series prints. And so that grieving mother from the Mexican poster clearly has references to Colwitz's um, images um, from the early, early or 20th century. Um, and, and some other sort of broader questions about other artistic influences on, I mean, beyond the sort of artists that she was working so closely with, um, are there sort of artists that were out, a little bit outside of her orbit that she was interested in and in, in looking at? You know, I think, uh, you know, I think that she is an artist who had a very broad training. Um, I think that her time at Howard, when she's there in the 1930s, that um, James Porter, who is there and, uh, James V. Herring, who's the chair of the department, really believed that those studio students should have a really broad understanding of the Western artistic tradition. And so they would have taken classes in sort of the whole of Western art. Uh, and then of course, training at the University of Iowa um, where you know Grant Wood on the one hand is advocating uh, sort of the regionalist sort of American scene approach uh, and what she would have been seeing there. Um, in terms of specific artworks other than um, sort of the influence of African sculpture as well as the Cathay Kolowitz uh, and then whatever would have been um, you know the visual culture that she's sort of consuming and going and going to see. Um, I'm always hesitant to name sort of super specific things if we if they don't sort of articulate them um, themselves. 
it becomes sort of what you can see and in, in yeah you're yeah um I had a, I'm gonna um ask one of my own questions that I've I've been thinking about um and then I leave room for a couple more um so I'm interested in in Catlett you mentioned it so I'm gonna bring it up the, her time at, at Howard and what you know that what that department was was doing um and and just sort of some of the things that you dropped into your talk where um, like Porter talks about her good taste mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, and what that, how that department, which was so formative, doesn't seem like, I mean, it does feel like she, she almost breaks from, from them or she breaks from some idea. I don't, if you have sort of a sense of the zeitgeist of what that, how that department was sort of seeing itself um, in terms of, you know, taste making, mm -hmm. um, it's just it seems like they there was a real sort of sense of um of sort of black art and black visual culture that they that that they were really attending to and that i can't tell if she's reacting to um or if she you know what the what what some of the what i'm feeling there about her relationship with howard so i would say that probably the opposite that she's exactly you know she's a shining star from that department um i think you know the Howard University Art Department is founded in 1921. So Catlett comes there 10 years later. It's a new, still a new department, right? She's being taught by young faculty. Lois Mealy Jones, Porter gets there in 1928. Lois Jones joins in 1930. So these are students that are fresh off there. I mean, Porter was fresh off of his undergraduate there program there. And um, Lois Mealy Jones, you know, had just finished from uh, the Museum School of the Fine Arts Boston in 1926. So these are young faculty also trying to find their way as artists. I would say that if anything, that you're absolutely right, that the Howard University Art Department is interested in being a hub for African-American art African-American art production and wants to create these spokes outward. So Catlett going from Howard to Iowa, then to Dillard, that's an amazing spoke, right? Back down, Dillard was had recently been founded. So she's there. Then she's another, you know, Samella Lewis becomes another spoke off of Catlett. I think in terms of, uh, you know, that at, in the 1930s, the Howard University Art Department is not promoting necessarily um, social justice infused artwork, but Catlett's not making that art in the 1930s. And by the time she does make that art, um, the Howard University Art Department has also evolved and is doing that also. Um, I think that what is interesting about her time at Howard uh, and is a factor, I think, of it being a young department, and I'll make a plug, on the 23rd of September the um, is Alma Thomas Day uh, and the National Gallery of Arts doing a full day of programming about Alma Thomas, who is the first graduate of the um, Howard University Department, I'll be talking about Howard uh, for part as part of that. But um, is that because Porter and Jones were young, that they really competed for students, and Catlett is often um, cited as being one of James Porter's students, and she actually studied with Lois Jones first, and Porter poached her and told her not to work with Jones, but to work with him, and I think there's this interesting question of gender that's at play there that could be unpacked further, um, so I think that she is, yeah, kind of uh, an example of exactly what Howard um, wanted to to end up with to claim as an alumna great great um okay we are um well over time but um i'm so glad that people have stuck with us i'm going to finish with this one question because it kind of um uh, encapsulates a, a number of questions here um about um the sort of universalizing images that catlett uses um and um i think the maybe I'm interpreting this, but the in, the absence of, of really personalized imagery. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Amanda Leister had asked, I often read universalizing images as classical and traditional and canonical. Um, and do you have a sense, can you explain why you think Catlett chose to work in this sort of general universal um, realm instead of thinking more personally or making art that had sort of the more personal narrative? Yeah, well, I think that that is part of the desire to not have her work read biographically. I think that that is 
Um, what we oftentimes want to do when we have an artist of African-American descent is to see their work as uh, a direct translation of their own lived experience or a translation of uh, the Black experience. And I think it's important to think about how um, all artists are sort of interpreting and sort of it's not documentary per se, but rather interpretation. So I think that there's sort of a little bit of distance there um, because she is coming of age as a, of an artist, you know, in the 19, you know, when Jim Crow is alive and well in the South and sort of emerging through that and is aware of the way in which um, she might be pigeonholed, but she's still very much clearly committed to um, giving visual space to the lived experiences of Black women uh, and Brown women in particular. So that I, you know, um, yeah, I think that that's part of why we don't see sort of a lot of overt sort of biographical um, or sort of personal references in it. Great. Well, I'm so glad that we had this chance to hear from you today, Rebecca. This has been. I wish I could have been there in person. I know I did too. I'll and come I, back. then I'll we could have back. had, you know, we could have had a little celebration, and we could have, you know, spent time asking more, more questions. Um, but this is the way the world is. And we appreciate that you um, pivoted with us and were able to give this talk virtually. We all benefit from it because, again, it, it gives us all of this great foundation to walk into that um, to our exhibition here, um, and to and to really engage with Elizabeth Catlett, who you know, as as we know and have learned more, is was just a remarkable person, um, an artist. So, thank you so much for coming today, um, everyone who has remained here. Thank you for staying, um, and please come to the Cantor to see the exhibition. Um, you know the hours, but I, I will add that we're open right now. If you want to come down to the canter from your office, where you are, we'll be open until seven o'clock. Um, and again, thank you, Rebecca, and I will see everybody in the gallery soon. <laughs>